topic I have been asked to address today is faith and reason in Aquinas. <clears throat> Presumably, this is because John Paul II, in his 1998 encyclical letter, Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason, advocated a renewed retrieval of Aquinas' philosophy to counteract the nihilism he indicted in modern and contemporary philosophy. This encyclical provoked an enormous response from Catholic philosophers and theologians, polarizing them as much as it inspired them. Therefore, before I analyze faith and reason in Aquinas, I want to spend a few minutes reviewing why John Paul recommended Aquinas' philosophy as the medium for reconciling faith and reason, specifically as the remedy for the failure of modern and contemporary philosophy to recognize the necessity for faith to interact with reason. In Faith and Reason, John Paul depicted philosophy as the product of an innate drive of human reason to find the meaning of life and to search for truth and goodness. Thus, he regarded the development of the academic discipline of philosophy in Western culture as a refinement of everyone's informal philosophy of life and a codification of the universal philosophy manifest in manifold ways in the traditions of every culture. To philosophy as the product of pure reason, however, he contrasted Christian revelation as a matter of faith. In Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he said, truth was revealed in itself. The truth that God has crowned the quest of human reason for truth and goodness with the possibility of immediate union with himself, and the truth that Jesus' passion and death on the cross has confounded the pretensions of merely human wisdom. Thus, John Paul saw the function of theology to be the reconciliation of philosophy as the product of human reason with divine revelation as a matter of supernatural faith. The feasibility of a reconciliation between faith and reason, John Paul argued, arose from the need of each for the other. Faith needed reason both as a preparation for comprehending the truths of revelation and as a vehicle for communicating these truths to every age and culture. Reason, for its part, needed faith to inspire it, to transcend the preoccupation with mundane affairs and technical rigor by persisting in the quest for universal, and authentic, universal truth and authentic goodness. But he thought the process of reconciliation which had proceeded apace from biblical times until the Middle Ages, had broken down in the modern era and in contemporary culture. Beginning with the wisdom books of the Hebrew Bible and Paul's epistle to the Romans, and continuing through the early apologists to the fathers of the church and medieval theologians, the Pope said a positive, if cautious, relationship had developed between divine revelation and Greek and Latin philosophy because of a mutual commitment to seeking universal and absolute truth. But beginning in the later Middle Ages and continuing into the 19th and 20th centuries, philosophers rejecting the need of reason for faith forsook the quest for universal truth to concentrate upon small bore issues and technical finesse. The result was in the 19th century, the Pope said, a crisis of rationalism as philosophy degenerated into the equally deplorable alternatives of rationalism and fideism. And in the 20th century, a crisis of meaning, as it became infected as well with eclecticism, historicism, scientism, and pragmatism. In short, an end to metaphysics and a descent into nihilism. This is why John Paul appealed to St. Thomas as an exemplar of the way to do philosophy and theology. Aquinas traced the harmony of faith and reason to the fact that the light of both came from God, ensuring a unity of both in the pursuit of truth. To advance the cause of reason, Aquinas developed a philosophy in which, in dialogue with Arab and Jewish scholars, he assimilated the thought of Aristotle into metaphysics of nature. At the same time, he upheld the primacy of faith in a theology whose wisdom he attributed to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. John Paul quoted Paul VI to the effect that, quote, St. Thomas combined in himself 
the greatest boldness in his search for the truth, freedom of spirit in dealing with novel issues, and that mental honesty which belongs to those who, though they do not allow Christian truth to be in any way contaminated by secular philosophy, do, do not even so reject it out of hand a priori. The key point is he gave to the new encounter of faith and reason a reconciliation between the secularity of the world and the severest demands of the gospel, end quote. Thus, John Paul regarded Aquinas as a paragon for the reconciliation of faith and reason, not so much for the particular theories he espoused as for the method he employed to develop a philosophy capable of elucidating the truths of Christian revelation. In that light, it is of the greatest importance that John Paul grounded philosophy in self-knowledge. Taking his cue from the admonition, know yourself, carved over the portal at the temple of Delphi, John Paul said the journey to wisdom begins, quote, within the particular perspective of the unique self-awareness of man. For in that perspective, the more man comes to know the world and its affairs, the more he learns to understand himself and his own uniqueness. And with that, there presses upon him the urgent desire to find out about the meaning of reality and of our existence." End quote. From this desire, the Pope said, arise the primary questions. Who am I? Where do I come from? Where am I going? Why do evils appear? What remains to us after this life? The very questions of the world over in all times have generated the philosophical quest for the meaning of truth and goodness. It will be instructive, therefore, to see how Aquinas grounded his thought, philosophical and theological, in a philosophy of mind originating in self-knowledge. <clears throat> so, to represent Aquinas' take on faith and reason, I am not going to summarize the various statements he made on the subject over the course of his career, or just lift a definitive statement on the matter from the Summa Theologiae. That would be too simplistic and superficial a treatment <clears throat> of a subtle and complicated issue. Instead, I'm going to trace Aquinas' lifelong struggle to resolve the issue, beginning with a review of his social and cultural background and concluding with an analysis of how he based his philosophy upon self-knowledge. Aquinas' entire career as a theologian was a quest to reconcile faith and reason by making theology into a science, one as legitimate and rigorous in his own way as the natural sciences or mathematics. His method was to move out of his base in Augustine's philosophy of mind to appropriate Aristotle's metaphysics as a medium for interpreting the articles of faith. This was no easy task. To appreciate his achievement, it will be helpful to review three elements in his development. The first, his conception of his mission as a theologian. Secondly, the steps he took to formulate the philosophy of mind undergirding his theological syntheses. And finally, the source of his philosophy of mind in self-knowledge. Aquinas' conception of his mission as a theologian comprises three factors. His Dominican vocation, his opposition to the Muslim interpretation of Aristotle, and his own ambivalence about Aristotle's philosophy. Aquinas entered the Dominican order, the order of preachers, in 1244 at the age of 19 or 20, while he was a student in the arts faculty at the University of Naples. At the age of five or six, his father, a feudal lord, had presented him as an oblate at the Benedictine Monastery of Monte Cassino, perhaps with the expectation that he would eventually become the abbot of this ecclesiastical fief. But at the University of Naples, Aquinas forsook his attachment to feudalism in any form joining the order of the Dominican friars who were among his professors. The Dominicans had been founded in 1215, along with the Franciscans, the order of friars minor, 
to preach the gospel in word and deed to the masses of fugitives from serfdom huddled outside the walls of the newly founded communes, Bologna, Lyon, Paris, Toulouse, Cologne, that had sprung up at the crossroads of trade unions. Needing a theological education for their members, both of these mendicant orders gravitated to the University of Paris, famed for both its arts and theology faculties. At the University of Paris, Thomas was a student of both the arts and theology faculties from 1245 to 1256, becoming successively a Bachelor of Arts, a Bachelor of Theology, and a Master of Theology, technically a Magister in Sacra Pagina, a Master of the Sacred Scriptures. In 1257, at the insistence of the Pope, Thomas and Bonaventure from the Franciscans became, despite the opposition of the secular faculty, the first candidates from the mendicant orders to be admitted to the Consortium Magistrorum, to the body of the masters of the theology faculty of the university. For the rest of his life, Aquinas taught theology, splitting his time between two regencies at the University of Paris and two periods in Italy, partly at the papal court, but mostly at Dominican houses of study. The immediate readership for his magnum opus, the Summa Theologiae, were his own Dominican students. The second factor in Aquinas' conception of his mission as a theologian was his opposition to Muslim interpretations of, Aquinas, of Aristotle. As Islam swept from the Near East across North Africa into Spain in the seventh and eighth centuries, it appropriated the high culture of Byzantium, establishing cultural centers in Constantinople, Alexandria, and Cordoba. Embellished by a brilliant art and architecture, these centers foster the study of philosophy and theology, in addition to medicine, law, and history. Muslim scholars translated the entire Aristotelian corpus into Arabic, enabling philosopher theologians like Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd to write commentaries designed to reconcile Aristotle's philosophy with Muslim doctrine. Aquinas first encountered the Muslim interpretation of Aristotle to the West in his philosophical studies at the University of Naples under Michael the Scot and Peter the Irishman. He learned how Muslim theologians employed their knowledge of Aristotle to challenge such Christian doctrines as the Trinity, creation and time, the divinity of Christ, the real presence in the Eucharist, and individual human responsibility. Beginning with his first publications, De Anti et Essentia on Being and Essence, and in his commentary on the sentences, and continuing throughout his career, Aquinas sought to disentangle Aristotle's philosophy from the tentacles of his Muslim and Neoplatonist and Jewish commentators so that he could employ it as a rational armature for his theology. Thomas's most direct confrontation with Muslim interpreters of Aristotle was his Summa Condrigentis, originally entitled, A Book About the Truth of the Catholic Faith Against the Errors of the Infidels, in which he opposed a comprehensive Christian theology to the Muslim naturalistic philosophical worldview. The third factor in Aquinas' self-conception as, as a theologian was his ambivalence toward Aristotelian philosophy. Like every other medieval scholar, Aquinas was steeped in Augustine's thought, adopting Augustine's method of grounding theology and self-knowledge, as well as his explications of the doctrines of grace and the Trinity. Aquinas also welcomed Neoplatonic insights he found in the Greek fathers of the church, Pseudo Dionysius, and the author of the Liber de Causis. Yet Aquinas was captivated by Aristotle's philosophy because in its profundity and scope, it offered the promise of supplying the infrastructure for a scientific theology. At the same time, he had to rebut the use of it made by the arts faculty at Paris, the movement known as Latin Averroism or radical Aristotelianism, to oppose that naturalistic, supposedly more rational alternative to the supernatural and faith-based worldview of Christian doctrine. 
to foster a more accurate version of Aristotle's thought than he found in the Latin translations from the Arabic versions of Aristotle's works, Aquinas sponsored William of Mirbeke's translation of the Aristotelian corpus from the original Greek into Latin and proceeded himself to make a set of systematic commentaries on almost all of the works in their new translation. Because of this discriminating appropriation of Aristotle's philosophy, Aquinas's career as a theologian can be summarized perhaps too facilely as an adoption of Aristotelian philosophy as a method for understanding Christian doctrine together with an opposition to Aristotelian philosophy, and indeed all of Greek philosophy, as a naturalistic system antithetical to Christian doctrine. These are then the three main factors in Aquinas' self-conception as a theologian. His vocation as a Dominican friar, his opposition to Muslim interpretations of Aristotle, and his adoption of Aristotelian thought as a method for theology, but not as a system of philosophy. Now I want to look at the steps that Aquinas took to develop the philosophy of mind that was the basis for the reconciliation he made between faith and reason. Aquinas had to undertake a long and arduous course of self-education to fulfill his ambition of becoming a scientific theologian while at the same time making theology into a science. There were five phases in his self-education. His commentaries on the literary sources of both Christian doctrine and pagan philosophy, his philosophical and theological monographs, his disputations on crucial questions in the relationship between faith and reason, his successive syntheses of the material from his commentaries, monographs, and disputations, and finally, the spin-off from these syntheses in polemical essays, requests for his expert opinion on current issues, and liturgical works, sermons, and prayers. In short, in his short but productive career, Aquinas sought to become expert in what today would be the separate specialties of scriptural exegesis, history of doctrine, systematic theology, apologetics, moral theology, pastoral theology, and liturgy. He mastered the field. Now the first stage in Aquinas' self-education were the commentaries in which he deepened his knowledge of both the Bible and philosophical works. He commented on Genesis, Isaiah, Psalms, and Job in the Hebrew Bible, and practically the entire New Testament. He also compiled a glossa which contained quotations from the Greek fathers on every single verse in the New Testament. Legend has it that he knew the Bible by heart. And the legend, the Vulgate version, and the legend may be true because John Milton was known to have the King James Bible off by heart. He certainly deployed, displayed an intimate knowledge of the Bible and patristic tradition in the numerous and apposite citations he included in his summas. Both early and late, Aquinas wrote commentaries on a number of philosophical works. Through Dionysius, Boethius' treatise, but the most important of the commentaries were, of course, his commentaries on the works of Aristotle. Now, he did not write these commentaries until the latter part of his career. But as I mentioned before, he had begun to be familiar with Aristotle from his first years in the arts faculty at Naples with the well-known Michael the Scot and Peter the Irishman. Uh, so what he did was to pursue this careful analysis of, of Aristotle's thought so that not only he but others could be able to incorporate it into the development of 
theology. Now, the next step after the commentaries on both scripture and philosophy were the monographs he wrote on crucial philosophical issues throughout his career. In his first Paris period, he wrote monographs on the principles of physical nature, on being and essence, and on the proper governance of princes. And in the second Paris period, he wrote other monographs on crucial questions. The most important of these was the monograph on being and essence, in which he appropriated Avicenna's distinction between essence and existence, a theory he would later use to explain the difference between God as having an identity of essence and existence and creatures as having a distinction between their essences and their existence. The third phase, after the commentaries, after the monographs, the third phase of his development consisted in undertaking disputations on controversial theological topics. This was an option for masters of theology at the time, and Aquinas made the most of it. The first kind of disputation was, in effect, a course on a particular topic that a master of theology conducted twice a week over an academic year. So the master would get up, everybody in the audience could pose questions, the master would take the notes, and he would come back the next day, uh, two days later, to resolve the issue. Now, Aquinas did these disputations on the soul, on spiritual creatures, on evil, on the virtues, on the study of the incarnate word, but his most important disputation was the disputation on truth. It might better have been entitled, On the Mind, in relation to being, as intellect in relation to being as truth, and as will in relation to being as goodness. In the 253 questions of this disputation conducted over three academic years, Aquinas forged the philosophy of mind, combining his Augustinian and Aristotelian sources in the philosophy of mind he would later employ in his syntheses. A signal achievement was his analysis of the activity of knowing. He represented it as an interaction in our mind between the impact of the data of sensory experience and the demand of our minds for the truth. The initial step, he said, was to assimilate the information gained from sensory experience into images representative of the object of our study and to propose hypotheses about the meaning of the object. The next step was to reflect upon these hypotheses until we arrive at the hypothesis we judge best corresponds with the data. At that point, we state our opinion, the truth as we see it, with the realization that we might have to change our mind either because, the new data, because new data become available or because we demand a better explanation of the object. He also conducted these quad libertales disputations, which were all about anything that could come up. And he dealt with a whole range of, of, of controversial issues, getting to know them one by one so that he would then have them ready for his syntheses. Now, the most important phase in Aquinas' campaign to make a science of theology were the three syntheses of theology that he wrote at the beginning, the middle, and the end of his career. The commentary on the sentences, the Summa Contragentes, and of course, the Summa Theologiae. In this phase, Aquinas employed as the theoretical armature of his theology, the philosophy of mind he had fused from his sources in Augustine, Aristotle, and Dionysius. It provided him with both the format for his syntheses and his solutions to crucial questions of Christian doctrine. Now, the first effort was his commentary on the sentences, which was a kind of comprehensive exam that he had to do as a bachelor of theology in order to become a master of theology. 
the sentences of Peter Lombard <coughs> were written in 1152, and they were designated in 1230 as the official textbook of theology throughout Christendom and remained so for 300 years. It was an anthology of patristic opinions, particularly from Augustine, on the entire range of Christian doctrines. It had a list of all the major doctrines. First book was on the triune God, the second on God as creator and the whole work of creation, the third on the incarnation and redemption, and then the last on the sacraments and the last things. Initially, bachelors of theology, in order to become a master, would do a fairly liter literal and superficial reconciliation of contrary opinions. But by the time of Aquinas, because of the imp import of Aristotelian philosophy, the burden had shifted so that the bachelor would do an analysis of all of the controversy surrounding any of the doctrines of Christianity. Now, <clears throat> in his commentary, Aquinas employed the philosophy of mind he would elaborate in greater detail and with more subtlety in his later synthesis. First of all, the human mind as the image of God provided the pivot for the theme he had adopted for unifying all of the doctrines of Christianity, the theme of departure and return, of creation and redemption. The departure originated in the processions of the persons within the Trinity and extended to the procession from God of humanity as the apex of creation. The return began with the Son of God becoming incarnate in human form and culminated in humanity's redemption from sin and final union with God. At each stage of this circuit, Aquinas posited the human mind as the basis of his explanation. In book one, Aquinas argues that the theology of the entire work is possible only because the human mind as the image of God is capable of knowing God. Now admittedly only through arguments and symbols, but ultimately by identity with God in the beatific vision. In book two, Aquinas says, creation is to be understood through its end. Humanity is the image of God, principally because of the human mind. In book three, Aquinas contends that the word of God became incarnate as a human being because humanity in its combination of body and soul is the horizon and border unifying spiritual and corporeal nature. And in book four, he presents the sacraments and the final resurrection as the remedy for humanity's corruption from original sin and the means for humanity to be united finally with God in the beatific vision. Not only did he use his philosophy of mind for the conception of the whole of his commentary, but he used it to deal with particular questions. The knowledge of God, God's knowledge and the procession of persons in the Trinity. So he drew upon the sources that he had in his philosophy, uh, philosophical background, but the crux of it was his own philosophy of mind as a living theoretical unification of his conceptions of Christian doctrines. Now, His second attempt at a theological synthesis was a summa contra gentes, which was an original and comprehensive treatise on the reasonableness of Christian doctrine. It's not very clear what the purpose of this was and who the audience was, but scholars are, seem to be coming to an agreement that it was basically a book of wisdom in which Aquinas, for the edification of literate and cosmopolitan Christians, 
very few, of course, because in those days, at least 80% of the people were illiterate. So you only had a very small percentage of those who could read. That he, kept, that he confronted the philosophical wisdom contained particularly in the works of Aristotle and his commentators with an initiation to Christian wisdom. Now he divided the work into two parts. In the first three books, he dealt with the Christian doctrines that he thought were amenable to understanding by reason. The existence of God, the creation of the world, individual human responsibility. In the fourth book, he dealt with the Christian doctrines that were a matter of supernatural revelation. In the first three books, what he did was to provide arguments to try to establish the reasonableness of this complex of doctrines that govern the way in which we live as human beings. In the last one, what he did was to attempt to give plausible analogies for the Trinity, for the Incarnation, and for the sacraments. Now, the crucial part of the book of the Summa Contra Gentis occurs at the end of the second book, of, uh, second book of the Summa Contra Gentis and the early part of the third book in which Aquinas develops his philosophy of mind. He makes this philosophy of mind inclusive of his conceptions of human nature and human teleology the hinge of the entire work. It has both a theoretical and a practical component. The theoretical component in book two is that we know on the basis of personal experience that humanity is an existential unit of soul and body, and yet that the human soul is an incorruptible, subsistent spirit. The personal experience, he said, that grounds this belief is our consciousness of the nature of human action. Because we not only depend for all of our information upon sensory experience, but are individually responsible for our actions, physical and mental alike, the soul from which this activity emanates must be the form of the body. Yet, because our ability to know the truth includes a grasp of things in their universality and of ourselves as capable of such universal knowledge, and our capacity to do good includes a love of the good in itself with the option of choosing whatever we love, the soul must transcend the body as a subsistent spirit, communicating its own act of existence to the body. Therefore, Aquinas concludes, our souls are distinct from, but not separate from, our bodies. The practical component of this philosophy of mind, which Aquinas propounds in Book 3, is that we know on the basis of personal experience that humanity has a natural, if implicit, desire for the beatific vision and yet cannot attain that end without the grace of God. What is the personal experience? It is our consciousness of our appetite for our final end. We realize that we cannot be completely happy without understanding directly and immediately the ultimate cause of the universe, which as a matter of fact can be achieved only in union with God in the beatific vision. And yet, we are incapable of achieving that goal on our own because our understanding is not only finite, but intrinsically conditioned by its origin in sensory experience. Therefore, Aquinas concludes, we have a natural appetite for the beatific vision, 
But only through the supernatural grace of God can we hope to have that appetite fulfilled. Now Aquinas uses this conception of the human mind in all of the other parts of the Summa Contra Gentis as well in his analyses of God, God's essence, God's creation, and the Trinity. Now, the last of his theological syntheses is, of course, his magnum opus, the Summa Theologiae. He wrote it as a comprehensive textbook for beginners in theology. And he organized it in a kind of deductive mode, proceeding from principles to conclusions, to avoid the disorder and repetition he deplored in other theology textbooks. As opposed to the Summa Contragentes, the Summa Theologiae integrates the rationally demonstrable and the analogically intelligible truths of Christian doctrine in a unitary framework. From the outset, Aquinas emphasized the intrinsically theological nature of the work, naming God as both the subject and the object of theology. The subject, because of God's communication of the light of faith and the revealed principles upon which theology depends for its understanding of particular Christian doctrine. The object, because of theology being concerned only with God and with everything else insofar as it proceeds from God as the efficient cause and returns to God as the final cause of creation and redemption. So the framework for the Summa Theologiae is once again the salvation history of creation and redemption, pivoting on the analogy between the divine mind as exemplar and the human mind as image. The first part of the Summa Theologiae is devoted to the exemplar. God, both as he is in himself, in the unity of the divine essence and the trinity of the divine persons, and in his action as the creator and rector of the universe. The third part concerns the perfect image of God in Jesus Christ, who redeems humanity through his passion, death, and resurrection, and elevates it through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the church as a whole and in each human soul. But the second part of the Summa, between God and himself and Jesus Christ, is concerned entirely with humanity. The admittedly imperfect image of God, who is nevertheless the culmination of creation and the focus of redemption. Once again, in the latter half of the first part of the Summa, Aquinas takes up humanity, the composite of both spirit and matter, as the terminus of his exposition of the departure of the universe from God and creation. In analyzing humanity, Aquinas immediately notes that theology considers human nature primarily in terms of the soul and within the soul, primarily in terms of the intellective and repetitive operations. The intellective operation proceeds to analyze in the first part of the competitive operation in the second part. The point of his analysis of our intellectual operations is to show that the human soul, specifically because of the mind, is truly made to the image of God and destined, therefore, ultimately, to be united with God as an example. At the beginning of the second part, before undertaking his analysis of the operations of the will, Aquinas frames his analysis by declaring that humanity is made to the image of God precisely because of our powers of intellect and free judgment. Meaning that a human being is the principle of all one's actions because of having this freedom of judgment and control over one's actions. On that basis, Aquinas proceeds to analyze humanity in terms of its pursuit of its final end, beginning with our natural appetites and the of vision, and culminating in the supernatural conversion by which God, now through grace and later through glory, saves us from sin and elevates us to union with Himself. He completes this analysis 
to a detailed study of the virtues that we need to move from our initial conversion to our final end and the various stages in which we may conduct our life. As Aquinas takes up a bath, two thirds of the Summa Theologiae, with his philosophy of mind in terms of its import for our cooperation in our own redemption. And he uses this philosophy of mind throughout the rest of the Summa. Again, for our knowledge of God, for God's knowledge of himself, for the processions of the persons in the Trinity, for the suitability of the incarnation, and as a key to the understanding of the church itself. Now the final phase of Aquinas' quest to become a scientific theologian by making theology into a science includes the spin-offs from his theological syntheses. Just to have produced what he has done in what I've said so far would seem to take up the lifetime of several theologians. But in addition to that, he wrote various polemical treatises against those who were impugning the right of the mendicant order to teach in Paris and against the Averroists. He wrote hundreds of letters in response to requests for his expert opinion. And in addition to that, he composed liturgical pieces, including the Office of Corpus Christi and the well-known hymn Adoro Te Devote. It's incredible. Now, I'm not going to go into that because I want to focus upon what is most important. That is, Aquinas' derivation of his theology and philosophy from self-knowledge. Aquinas analyzes self-knowledge in a number of his works. His commentary on Aristotle's The Anima, the disputed questions on truth, on the soul, and on spiritual creatures, and in other monographs. The most substantial of these treatments is the disputed question on truth in which Aquinas succeeded, as I've mentioned before, in melding his Augustinian and Aristotelian sources, but explaining core of his philosophy of mind and exploring it in detail in both its cognitive and volitional implications. But for our purposes today, perhaps the best source is the tidy summary that Aquinas gives of his philosophy of, uh, of mind rooted in self-knowledge in the Summa Theologiae. <clears throat> there he says, the mind knows itself in three ways. Each of us becomes conscious of our own mind in every act of understanding or willing. Secondly, we can all acquire philosophical knowledge of the nature of the mind by analyzing, in, in, analyzing it in terms of the powers revealed by the objects of its actions. And we can, concern, we can discern the ideal of the mind by considering it in light of divine faith, of divine truth, excuse me. In the first kind of knowledge, Aquinas says, each of us becomes aware of our own mind in every act of understanding and willing. We experience ourselves as someone who understands in every complete understanding and as someone who wills in every complete act of willing. Thus, we become aware of the powers of our intellect and will as well as of our minds as the subject of both powers. We also realize that the same principle, whether we call it the intellect or the intellective soul, is the principle as well of all our other, other activities, nutrition, sensation, locomotion. Aquinas emphasizes how we become aware of the inherent intelligence, the power and the nature of the act of understanding every time we engage in it. It is this awareness of our own intelligence that functions as both the origin of every theory of understanding and the criterion for evaluating the validity of any such theory. <clears throat> the second kind of self-knowledge Aquinas recognizes is the philosophical or categorical knowledge of the nature of the soul. <clears throat> 
This is the strategy that he found in Aristotle, who argued that we can come to understand the soul in terms of the powers revealed in an analysis of the objects of its acts. In the Summa Theologiae, Aquinas analyzed the power of the intellect in terms of its understanding of three kinds of object. Bodies, the soul itself, and separate substances, including God. And the power of the will in terms of the acts by which it loves the good, intends happiness as its final end, and chooses the means to attain it. This kind of self-knowledge, in which the soul becomes the explicit object of understanding, is, of course, the mode that Aquinas employed in the first part of the Summa to understand the souls in terms of the power of intellect, and in the second part to understand the soul in terms of the power of will. The third kind of self-knowledge Aquinas acknowledges is a theological or transcendental knowledge of the soul in light of divine truth. This is the mode for whose discovery he, he accredits uh, Augustine. Augustine, he says, modified Plato's conception of the truth as a participation in subsistent ideas that we can mentally, that we can mentally perceive. What Augustine did was first to interpret the ideas, not as objects in and of themselves, but as exemplars in the mind of God. And secondly, to interpret our knowledge of these exemplars, not as a perception of them as objects, but as an awareness of them in the light, natural or supernatural, by which we understand things and judge the truth of our understanding. This is the kind of knowledge that Aquinas referred to in the Summa when he defined theology as a science governed by a participation in the light of God's own knowledge and issuing in an understanding of the world as a circuit of creation and redemption, pivoting on the analogy between God as the exemplar and humanity as the image of a mind capable of knowing the truth and loving the good. Now, having looked at Aquinas' development of the philosophy of mind, in the frame of the questions posed by John Paul II in his encyclical Faith and Reason, what can we say about Aquinas? From this analysis of Thomas Aquinas' method of reconciling faith and reason, several conclusions can be drawn about how well it fulfills John Paul II's recommendation of Aquinas as an exemplar for contemporary Catholic philosophers and theologians. First of all, it's obvious from Aquinas' example that any current attempt to reconcile faith and reason requires serious study of both the sources of Christian doctrine and the principal representatives of modern and contemporary philosophy. What Aquinas did in his day to develop a theology that was both faithful to Christian tradition and knowledgeable about contemporary philosophical currents must be emulated by anyone who today aspires to follow in his footsteps. But in the over 700 years separating us from Aquinas, the demands of scholarship have increased exponentially with the proliferation of specialization in all fields of study, including both theology and philosophy. Therefore, although anyone interested in reconciling faith and reason must have a passing familiarity with the specialties in both fields, no one today can master both fields in a way comparable to Aquinas. Collaboration among scholars is the order of the day, along with reliance upon a method that fosters such collaboration. Secondly, while Catholic philosophers and theologians in particular would profit from a sound grasp of Aquinas' thought, they cannot remain confined to it if they expect to communicate the reasonableness of the Christian doctrine in, in contemporary setting. We live in a postmodern world as John Paul observed in Faith and Reason. And as he recommended, postmodern as well as modern philosophy deserves serious consideration. 
He acknowledged that modern philosophy, despite its propensity for nihilism, has made significant advances in a number of philosophical specialties, including logic, philosophy of language, epistemology, the philosophy of nature, anthropology, hermeneutics, as well as in the studies of perception, the subconscious, irrationality, intersubjectivity, freedom and goodness, time and history, and death itself. He also noted how many Catholic philosophers and theologians had profited from their study of modern and contemporary philosophers. We have only to recognize the impact of Kantian and Hegelian thought on transcendental Thomism, as well as the immersion of analytic Thomism in Anglo-American analytic philosophy. So I think the attitude of contemporary Catholic philosophers and theologians to Aquinas should be something like Aquinas' attitude toward Augustine. A recognition of the permanent validity of his philosophy of mind as the basis for a sound philosophy. And their attitude to modern and contemporary philosophers, something like Aquinas' attitude toward Aristotle. A recognition of the scope and profundity of his philosophy. This approach, I think, would make for a mutually beneficial exchange between Thomistic and other schools of contemporary philosophy. Finally, I think the most profound conjunction between John Paul and Thomas Aquinas is their mutual belief in the foundation of philosophy in self-knowledge. As both of them depicted self-knowledge as not essentially a theoretical, but an existential achievement. It originates in reflection upon our consciousness of our own activities, particularly the activities of knowing and loving in all of their ramifications. Yet this existential self-knowledge can result in theoretical self-knowledge, either the categorical knowledge to be achieved through the human sciences or the transcendental knowledge to be gained through philosophy. But it remains the gauge by which each of us is empowered to judge the validity of any such theory. I think the most important value of Aquinas' philosophy is to remind us that the task of philosophy is not primarily the acquisition of historical or theoretical knowledge, but the deepening and sharpening of our personal self-knowledge. Thank you.